Good afternoon, students, and welcome to afternoon session of this face-to-face uh, -face facilitation, technology-driven one. So welcome to NSC 208. The facilitator is here. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. You are welcome to technology driven facilitation of NSC 208. Uh, NSC 208 is general and cellular pathology. I'm Olado Sonike, the e tutor for the course. Uh, so let's quickly look at the outline. During our face-to-face, -face, during our online facilitation on LMS, we're able to discuss 11 study sessions. So that's what we'll be looking at this afternoon. We'll just do a quick recap of what we learned during our online facilitation via LMS. So this afternoon, we'll quickly look at introduction to pathology and general mechanism of disease, pathogenesis of infection, dynamics of disease, effects of disease on organs, inflammation and infection, chemistry of cell damage and the dying cell, inflammatory response and chemical mediators, cellular responses to stress and nocial uh, stimuli, repair and reorganization of cell structure. Pathology and pathogenesis of oedema and pathology and pathogenesis of shock. So that's what we'll be discussing this afternoon. It's just a revision of what you learn during online facilitation via LMS. So we'll look, quickly look at what is pathology. Pathology may be defined as the scientific study of the molecular, cellular tissue, or organ system response to injurious agents, agents or adverse influences. So pathology is the study, is the scientific study of the molecular, cellul uh, molecular cellular tissue or organ. And we have pathology is divided into anatomic pathology and um, is divided into anatomic pathology. Anato an anatomic pathology is further divided into surgical pathology and forensic pathology. Another division of uh, pathology is clinical pathology. So we have three subunits. We have three main units in pathology. That's virology, bacteriology, and parasitology. Virology is the study of virus. Bacteriology study of uh, bacteria and the relationship with their host. Then parasitology is the story of um, parasites. So before we continue, we'll quickly look at basic terms. Some basic terms um, in pathology. The first one is infectivity. Infectivity is a measure of the ability of a disease agent to establish itself in the host. We also have virulence, which can be defined as a measure of the severity of a disease caused by a specific specified agent. Then we also have pathogenicity, which is the ability of a particular disease agent of no virulence to produce disease in a range of hosts under a range of environmental conditions. So moving on, we'll look at other, uh, other definitions too, like repetent period, incubation period. Repetent period is the period between the infection of the host by the agent and the detection of the agent in the tissues or secretions of the host. Then incubation period is a period of time that, elas that elapses from the infection of the host by the agent to the appearance of clinical symptoms. Also, 
we look at period of communicability. It's the period of time during which an infected host remains capable of transmitting the infective agent. We also look at tissue tropism, which is the affinity of the viral for specific uh, tissue. The affinity the virus have for specific body tissue. Then moving slow, uh, quickly, we'll quickly look at viral pathogenesis. Pathogenesis is a process by which an infection leads to diseases. Pathogenesis is just a mechanism, a process through which infection can lead to diseases or to disease. So we want to look at um, the mechanism, the stages through which an infection can lead to diseases. The first one is implantation of virus at the portal of entry. The second one is lo local replication. The third one is spread to target organs. And the fourth one, the third one is spread to target organs. Implantation of the virus at the portal of entry is it could be through inoculation, inhalation, or contact with the particular um, microorganism. When um, um, when a host comes in contact with uh, a microorganism, let's say, for instance, and, um, tetanus, um, clostridium tetanus, maybe that into the host. The virus will enter into the host through these uh, roots, and that is the implantation of the virus at the Multiplication of the virus at the site of entry. At that site, then the virus will multiply at that site of um, entry. Then also spread from the site of entry um, region through the blood vessel to spread to the target site organ is usually the nerve ending. Ending. Then the last one is spread to spread to site of shedding of the virus into the also the site of spread of the virus. If you look at the present uh, coronavirus, the site of entry is through the natural the site for shedding of the virus into the environment. So we are moving on now. We we'll look at factors that affect pathogenic that affect pathogenic mechanism. Factors that affect pathogenic mechanism or processes. One is accessibility of the virus. Second is successive viral and because local temperature, pH, and oxygen, then digestive enzyme and bile in the GIT.
Hello. Hello. So sorry about that break. Um, it was due to network issues. So we stopped at disease. And we said disease can be defined as a state in which an individual exhibits anatomical, physiological, biochemical deviation from normal. So it's an abnormal state. And what are the risk factors of disease? One is genetic. Another one is age, lifestyle, stress, and environmental factor. We all can relate with this. When we say age, two extreme age, extreme age, extremes of age makes one susceptible to um, disease. Then lifestyle example is like a diabetes mellitus in which the lifestyle of the patient will influence or predispose an individual to developing that um, non-communicable disease. Then stress also, stress lower uh, the immune system and also environmental factor may, may predispose to uh, disease. What are the stages of infectious and diseases? Stages of infectious disease. The process through which microorganisms cause disease involves several or all of the following stages. The first one is encounter, that's coming in contact with the disease at the first instance, coming in contact with the microorganism. The second one is colonization. Colonization is replication, multiplication of this um, particular disease. Then penetration is just like transfer or movement of that disease to other organs and spread also and damage the damage that will be done by this microorganism that will be done to the body. That's the damage. Then the last one is resolution. The last one is resolution. So we want to look at mechanism of damage, the process of damage. Now looking at the process of damage, there are three major mechanisms. First one is bulk effect. This bulk effect of a tissue damage, we can see it in ailment infection of intestine. All this warm infection, it could block the hollow organs, thereby causing damage to the organ. And that is what we can see in, in, case of, uh, in cases like elephantiasis, in which the, um, the worm will block the uh, lymphatic vessels, thereby causing fluid to be lost into the um, extravascular spaces. Then we have toxin med uh, mediated uh, damage. That is what we can see in case of a tetanus, in which the, where the clostridium technique will release toxins that would act on the nerves, in which the patients will start having clonic and tonic uh, seizures. Then also we have the host, host response to infection. So we want to quickly look at dynamics of disease. 
Uh, infection can be defined as the invasion of a living organism, the host, by another mm -hmm. living organism, that is the agent. Now for infection to occur, we need a host, which is human being, then the organism, which is um, the agent that will infect the host. What are the methods of transmitting infectious agents? One is through contact. I said it earlier on, it could be through contact with the infected host. And presently, the global pandemic that is um, ravaging the world, one of the ways to come in contact to contact coronavirus is through contact with the infected host. Then two is inanimate objects. If the, my particular microorganism has rested on that object, then one can contact it. Then the third one is through factor. These factors, we can see uh, example of it is mosquito. Mosquito bite, mosquito itself is a factor of, um, of a malaria parasite, all these uh, fasciparum. So through um, mosquito bites, that's the third way in which a um, microorganism can, one can contact a uh, microorganism. So what I we want to quickly look at host agent relationship host agent relationship. The relationship between infection and disease frequently is dynamic in nature. And the relationship is centered on the balance that can be achieved between the resistance me uh, mechanism, the host, and the infectivity and the virulence of agents. So the relation, there must be a balance so that uh, before infection can occur in a host, then the organism must be highly infective and um, it must also have a high virulence um, rate. An agent can improve its chances of survival, that is the microorganism, by creation of a carrier state. We'll look at that, and also by true antigenic variation. So for a microorganism to survive in a host, it can create a carrier state in that host, or true antigenic variation, which could be antigenic drift or shift. So let's quickly look at creation of the carrier state. It is used to describe an individual that is, is infected by a disease agent and is capable of disseminating that disease agent but show no symptoms of clinical disease. We have a lot of carrier patients all around. They are not showing symptoms, but despite that they can infect other people by shedding the virus and transmitting it to other people. So we have different types of carrier. We have true carrier, we have incubatory carrier, and we have convalescent carrier. Convalescent carrier are those that have had the disease and are recuperating already. But despite the fact that they are recuperating, they can still transmit the infection to other people. So ways of transmission of infectious agents. Ways of infectious agents. Factor, factor can transmit infectious agents in two ways. One is we have the mechanical transmission. We have the mechanical and biological transmission. Mechanical transmission occurs when infectious agent is conveyed from one host to another without undergoing a stage of development. It's, uh, it's when, uh, when the microorganism does not undergo a stage of development in that host, then you call it a mechanical transmission. Then biological transmission is when is when infectious agent can undergo some stage or stage, uh, stage of development in the vector, in the vector. Example is what I cited the other time, malaria parasite, when we have um, mosquito. Now the, the, the female Anopheles uh, mosquito, the parasite undergoes a development, a multiplication in the vector, such as asexual, um, se uh, sexual uh, reproduction, uh, to, uh, usually takes place in the mosquito. So we'll quickly look at effects of disease on organs. Effects of disease on organs. Disease and illness target all body system, such as the circulatory, the digestive, reproductive, endocrine, neurological, skeletal, and muscular system. 
Disease types include contagious, non-contagious, gender-related, and age-related diseases. We have contagious disease. We have all these coronavirus, uh, mumps, and the rest. Non-contagious disease. We have diabetes mellitus, renal failure. It's they are non-contagious. Then gender-related. We have some diseases that have higher chances in female. We, in fact, gender-related disease, pelvic inflammatory disease, is common to female. Then age-related disease. Diseases are more common in the elderly. So we have reproductive tract infection. We may not be able to look at all the system. So we'll be picking just reproductive tract, um, reproductive organ, and look at the disease affecting the reproductive uh, tract. Reproductive tract infections are infections that affect the reproductive tract. And you know, we have the upper reproductive tract, which has the which we have the fallopian tube, the uterus, and the lower reproductive tract, which is the vagina, the suffix, the suffix. So the three types of reproductive tract, tract infections are the endogenous infection, the heterogenic infections, and sexually transmitted infections. So we'll quickly look at uh, moving on now, we'll do quick have a quick recap on the chemistry of cell damage and the dying cell. And here we'll be looking at cell injuries, cell damage, um, auto, uh, autophagy and the rest. So cell injury is defined as an event or stimulus such as a toxic chemical that perturbs the normal homeostasis of the cell. Anything that affects the normal homeostasis of the cell will result into cell injury such as a, a persistent irritation of the cell can result into cell injury. While cell damage can result in death of individual cell or tissue or organ failure. Now persistent stress, persistent irritation of the cell can further result into death of that individual cell. Cell injury can be reversible or irreversible. The reversible one is when the stressor or the trigger is removed, then the cell will repair itself and return back to normal. So what are the causes of cell injury? We have oxygen deprivation, genetic derangement, nutritional imbalance, infectious agents, chemical agents, and drugs. And physical agents. Those are the causes of um, cell injury. So moving on now, we'll look at cell death. And you know, I said earlier on that cell injury, if the trigger or the irritant is not removed, it can result into the death of the cell. We have two principal types of cell death. The first one is necrosis, and the second one is Aptosis, apoptosis. Second one is apoptosis. Necrosis is an irreversible injury, a change that produce that is produced by enzymatic digestion of dead cellular elements. Why uh, apoptosis is a process that helps to eliminate unwanted cells by an interlandly programmed. Series of events. So, uh, what are the pattern of tissue necrosis? What are the pattern of tissue necrosis? The first one is coagulative necrosis. The second one is liquefactive necrosis. The third one is gangrenous necrosis. The third, the fourth one is cast. The first one is fat necrosis and fibrinoid uh, necrosis. So we'll quickly, move in, uh, we'll quickly move on to cellular aging. Aging is generally characterized by the declining ability to respond to stress. Cellular aging is the result of a progressive decline in the lifespan and functional capacity of cells. Now cells is programmed in such a way that a younger person can easily repair its own cell. But as aging comes in, the cell may not be able to perform the same function it has been performing before. 
What are the changes that can contribute to cellular aging? One is decreased cellular replication. The cell will not be able to replicate as it's used to do. And in this um, situation, that's where we have the telomeres. Then the second one is accumulation of metabolic and genetic uh, damage, accumulation of metabolic and genetic damage. So moving on now, we'll discuss inflammation and infection. Inflammation is defined as the local response of living mammalian, mammalian tissues to injury due to any agent. And uh, I could remember that school of nursing, usually we define inflammation as the response of the body to an irritant. So it's just the response of mammalian tissue to injury, that's inflammation. And we have two types of inflammation. We have acute and chronic inflammation. The acute is sudden in onset, and uh, while the chronic is prolonged, it is usually a long-term um, inflammation. When the acute fails to resolve, then you have chronic inflammation lasting more than six months. Then you term that chronic inflammation. What are the causes of inflammation? One, you have bones. Bone injury can result in inflammation. Chemical irritation, throat bites. Then we also have infection by pathogens physical injury and foreign bodies. Those are the causes of inflammation. We can add to it, we have a lot of things. Anything that will bring about an irritation will result in inflammation. So moving on, now we want to quickly look at stages of inflammation. There are five succeeding stages involved in inflammation. The first one is incubation. The second one is aggravation. Third one, destruction, abatement, and reconstruction. These are the stages of inflammation. We've discussed that during our online facilitation, we discuss it um, extensively. So now looking at So we want to quickly move on to inflammatory response and chemical mediators. Uh, inflammatory mediators are soluble, diffusible molecules that act locally and systematically at the site of tissue damage and infection and at more distant sites. That these mediators usually act at the site of injury. They are released, and most of them causes, um, they cause immediately, they cause passive constriction to prevent bleeding, further bleeding at the site of injury. So we have a number of these um, inflammatory mediators. Inflammatory mediators can be divided into exogenous mediators and endogenous mediators. And looking at it, we want to quickly look at early phase mediators, the ones that are released immediately, um, there is an infection. Early phase mediators are produced by mast cells and platelets. They are especially important in acute inflammation and they include mainly histamine, serotonin, and other fasoactive substances. So majorly, the early phase mediators, they are histamine serotonin, and they prevent uh, further bleeding as a site of injury. Then we want to look at late, late phase mediators. They are responsible for the regulation of vascular events occurring later. The, the first um, um, vascular events are caused, they are done by the early phase mediators. Why the one that occur after that? maybe six to 12 hours after initiation of inflammation. The late phase mediators are the one responsible for this. So look, moving on now, we'll look at plasma protein systems because all this helps in preventing and um, preventing tissue uh, injury and preventing hemorrhage. So looking at plasma protein systems now, increased vascular permeability allows exudation of plasma proteins which include a number of free mediator systems. So this plasma protein leads to activations of Eggman factor, that is factor 12 and factor 12A, from contact with collagen as plasma proteins effuse through the basement, through the basement membrane, which results in activation of several mediators. So this Eggman factor promotes activation of several other mediators of um, inflammation. So factor 
12a will now initiate activations of the kinin. And when you talk about kinin, you are talking about the bradykinins, which is one of these, the most common type of the kinin. The complement and the clotting prophibinolysis um, system. The plasma contains four interrelated systems of, of proteins that generate various mediators of uh, inflammation. The first one is the complement. The second one is the kinins. The third one is coagulation factor. And the fourth one is fibrinotic uh, system. So those are the plasma uh, proteins that helps in generation of uh, mediators of inflammation. So moving on now, we want to quickly look at cellular responses to stress and noxious uh, stimuli. Cellular stress response is a reaction to changes or fluctuations of extracellular conditions that damage the structure and function of macromolecules. So the reaction, the response of the cell to changes in the extracellular condition is what you call cellular response. So different stressors triggers different cellular response. Different stressors trigger different cellular responses. And these stressors, one, one of the things they do is that they will induce cell repair mechanism or they will induce cell responses that result in tem temporary adaptation to some stressors. And other one they do is that they can induce autograph, autophagy or trigger cell death. So those are the three things this uh, response could bring. It could reduce cell repair, in which the cell will repair itself if the irritation is taken off the cell. If the trigger is no longer there, then there will be a cell repair. But if it can also induce cell response that results in temporary adaptation to some stressor, the body will just adjust temporarily to the trigger, or it could induce auto autophagy or trigger cell death. If there could be uh, a, 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 a death of that cell if the irritation is persistent. So moving on, we want to look at adaptation because we said that one of the ways in which the cell responds to stress or is adaptation. Adaptation are, re are reversible functional and structural, structural responses to more severe physiological stresses and some pathological stimuli during which new but altered steady states are achieved, allowing the cell to survive and continue to function. So adaptation is when the body tends to adapt and adjust to the stressor. And after then, then repair can take place. So the adaptive response may consist of an increase in the size of the cell. That's one of the ways in which the body adapts. One is if the size of it, it can result in increase in the size of the cell, which we call hypertrophy and the functional uh, activity of the cell. Another way in which the body responds is it can, it, the body adapts, is there could be increase in the number of the cell. That we, that, that's what we call hyperplasia. And the third way is there is a decrease in the size and metabolic activity of the cell, that's atrophy of that particular cell. Then another way in which the body adapts is there could be a change in the phenotype of the cell, which we call metaplasia. When the stress is eliminated, the cell can recover to its original state without having suffered any harmful consequences. Now, if the stressor is removed, if the trigger is removed, then the body can repair itself. It can resolve, it can return back to its original state. That's what adaptation does. It will hold the body together till the stressor is removed so that the body can now return to its original um, state. So now we want to quickly look at repair and reorganization of cell structure. So we will look at cell damage and what causes um, cell damage. Cell damage can result in death of individual cells, tissue or organ failure and or death of the organism. So cell damage, it, it could be the death of the cell, the tissue, the organ itself. So what are the causes of um, cell damage? One is physical agents such as heat, radiation, or damage, which can damage the cell. 
Another one is impaired nutrient supply, especially oxygen. When there is no oxygen supply to the tissue, especially the, the lower extremities, when there is no supply of oxygen to those tissues, there could be easy um, deadening of that part, which will result in the death of that um, cell. And what are the target organs that are usually damaged? The target organ in the cells that are usually damaged. You know, in the cells, is the cell is just the basic unit that comprises of a number of organelles. And looking at the organelles in the cell, the, more, the ones that are more susceptible to damage, they are the DNAs of the cell and the cell membrane, the DNA of the cell and the cell membrane. We want to look at the uh, type of um, cell damage. We have reversible and lateral or irreversible. You can call it irreversible. It could be reversible. It could be irreversible. And uh, moving on now, we'll quickly look at repair. The process of cellular repair is either through regeneration and replacement. So the process could either take re regeneration of the cell, that is um, multiplication of that cell, bringing on new cells, or repl replacement of that particular cell. So we'll look at DNA repair. DNA repair is a collection of processes by which a cell identifies and corrects damage to the DNA molecule. The cell will identify the damage that has been done on that DNA, and it will now correct the damage on that uh, DNA. That is a um, DNA repair. The rate of DNA repair is dependent on many factors, including the cell type, the type of the cell, the age of the cell, and the extracellular environment of that cell. So there is, these three factors are very important in DNA repair. The, type of the cell, the age of the cell. If the cell is aging already, then the repair, repair may not be possible. Then the extracellular environment of the cell. DNA repair ability of a cell is vital to the integrity of its genome and the normal functionality of that organism. So because DNA is very important, uh, in fact, very important in the cell. So moving on now, We'll quickly discuss pathology and pathogenesis of edema. Pathology and pathogenesis of edema. And as we know that uh, edema is an abnormal collection of fluid in the tissue. It can collect in either the interst uh, in interstitial spaces or intracellular spaces. So when there is abnormal collection of fluid in the intracellular spaces, then you call it edema. And depending on the location of the edema, it could be uh, in the stomach, uh, the peritoneum, we call it ascites, the legs. So it can, there could be collection, it could be a generalized edema, it could be localized depending on where the fluid is collected. So we have type of edema, we have hydrostatic edema, we have permeability edema, and we have a lymphedema edema. This lymphedema edema is what you see in patients with filariasis, elephantiasis, where the the fatty vessel is blocked and fluid now accumulates in the tissues of the leg. So moving on now, we want to quickly look at pathophysiology of edema. Pathophysiology of edema, there are a lot of, depending on the cause of the edema, that will result in what we have. But for the sake of this presentation or this facilitation, we just want to look at hydrostatic pressure alone. Regional increase in hydrostatic pressure can result from a local impairment in fenous return. Now, when there is increase in hydrostatic pressure, maybe as a result of um, heart failure and the pressure increases, then the, fluid, the, the blood returning to the heart will not be able to uh, return flow, uh, normally as it used to because the heart is weak and is not pumping effectively. So there will not be accumulation of fluid, there will be accumulation of blood in the lower extremity, especially in the lower extremity, because the fenous return is deficient. And this fluid will not be lost into the tissues, and that's what we have res resulting in edema. So thus, deep fenous thrombosis in lower extremities may cause localized edema in the affected leg. So when there is a fenous thrombosis in that lower extremities, blood will not be able to return to the heart, 
definitely blood uh, fluid will be lost into the tissue. But generalized uh, increases in penous pressure with resulting system systemic edema occur most frequently in congestive heart failure, which I have earlier um, described for you. So moving on now, we want to quickly discuss shock, which is the last um, study session we discussed, shock. And we'll be looking at pathology and pathogenesis of shock. Shock is the inadequate perfusion or inadequate blood flow to bloody tissues, which can lead to decreased cellular function and ultimately cell death. Uh, shock is in level, we have early stage, we have signs and symptoms, that you will see in the early stage of shock. The patients will first present with mild tachycardia, where the blood pressure could be normal or raised. Then there could be cool and clammy skin. In fact, there will be cool and clammy skin. There will be lethargy, but the patient will still be conscious. But in the middle stage of uh, shock, there will be moderate tachycardia. You discover that the breathing, the, rest, uh, the pulse rate is increasing. The respiratory rate also is increasing because the body is trying to compensate, is requesting for more um, oxygen and blood supply. There will be weak and thready pulse. There will be confusion or unconsciousness. And in the late stage of shock, there is bradycardia, severe dysarrhythmia, coma, and marked hypotension. So how will the body compensate for this shock? body compensatory mechanism. That's what we'll be looking at now. The body attempts to compensate and resource perfusion by one, increasing cardiac output. Now, once there is um, inadequate blood and oxygen supply to, in fact, the important organs in the body, like the heart, the kidney, then the body will want to compensate by increasing the cardiac output, increasing the um, um, the heart rate. The second thing that happens is system, systemic stimulation of the sympathetic uh, nervous system causes an increase in heart rate. Then also there will be increased oxygen delivery to cells and distribution, redistribution. The body also will also, it will also result in redistributing the circulating blood volume to vital organs. But they, there will be blood pool to vital organ like the liver, the kidney. There will be facial constriction, release of antidiuretic hormones, stimulation of sympathetic nervous system will cause bronchodilation, thereby increasing uh, respiration. So we'll quickly look at types of shock. Uh, we have um, almost like five types of shock. We have cardiogenic shock, hypovolemic shock, septic shock, neurogenic shock and an anaphylactic shock. Cardiogenic shock is, see, is seen in cardiac condition like cardiac tamponade. Uh, you see it in myocardiac infarction. Then hypovolemic shock, you see it in patient that has lost a lot of fluid or blood in hemorrhagic situation in bones patients. Septic shock is as a result of septicemia, generalized sepsis. Then also neurogenic shock and uh, anaphylactic uh, Shock, which are a lot of uh, immune, um, autoimmune uh, uh, infection or autoimmune uh, disease. So, stages of shock now an initial non progressive phase during which reflex, reflex compensatory mechanisms are activated and perfusion of vital organs is, is maintained. That's the non progressive phase of shock. The, uh, the vital organs. There will still be blood supply to vital organs in the initial phase. Then the second one is progressive stage, which is characterized by tissue hypoperfusion and onset of worsening circulatory and metabolic imbalances, including acidosis. At this stage, you begin to see metabolic acidosis, respiratory, uh, respiratory alkalosis. Those are the things you see at the second stage of um, shock. Then also the last phase which is irreversible stage. And this sets in after the body has incurred cellular and tissue injury. So severe that even after the hemodynamic defects are corrected, survival is not possible. This stage is irreversible because there is a, a cellular and tissue injury that has been 
uh, sustained that has been uh, that has occurred. So now moving now, we want to just pick a particular type of shock and discuss it briefly. We'll be looking at septic shock. Septic shock is most Septic shock is most frequently triggered by gram, gram positive bacterial infection, followed by gram negative uh, bacterial and fungi. The gram positive infection uh, bacteria can cause it, likewise, the gram negative bacteria can cause it, but mostly is as a result of gram positive uh, bacterial infection. Uh, I want to look at major factors contributing to the pathophysiology of septic shock. One is the inflammatory mediators. The second one is the endothelial cell activation and injury. The third one is metabolic uh, abnormalities, immune suppression, and organ uh, dysfunction. Those are the major factors contributing to pathophysiology of septic shock because there will be inflammatory mediators, as we have discussed earlier on, that will be released. Then the endothelial cells activations and injury, metabolic abnormalities like respiratory alkalosis, metabolic acidosis, the immune suppression, and last one is organ dysfunction because most times it's usually generalized. So what are the initial assessments of patients in shock? First, you want to assess the airway. Is the airway patent? The second one, you want to check the breathing of that patient. Is the patient still breathing? Is there any difficulty in breathing? During this period, you want to turn the head of the patient to one side so that the patient can breathe well. Then you want to ensure that circulation is uh, the pain. You want to uh, check circulation. You want to check the skin. Is it cold and clammy? Is the patient pale? Those are the things you want to check for. You check the skin size, signs too. And lastly, you check the neurological status of the patient. Is the patient still conscious? Is it oriented to the three spheres of life? Is the patient um, comatose? Those are the things you want to check. Then lastly, you check the vital signs, which is very, very important. Check the blood pressure of the patient. You want to know if, the, if it is hypertension, you know that, okay, this is early phase of shock. If it is hypertension, you know that the patient is moving from the middle stage to the uh, late phase. Then you want to check the respiratory rate. Is it uh, tachycardia? Is it tachypnea? Is it, uh, is it uh, you want to check the posture too? Is it tachycardia? Is it uh, bradycardia? Those are the things you need to check in the patient. So what are the standard of care in septic shock? The standard of care in septic shock, one is you treat with appropriate antibiotics because you, we said it earlier on that uh, septic shock usually is as a result of um, bacterial infection, whether gram negative or gram positive. So you must use the broad, broad spectrum uh, antibiotics mm -hmm. after doing the culture, or you have done culture and sensitivity, and you know the particular organism responsible, then you give the appropriate antibiotics. Then you also give intensive insulin therapy for hyperglycemia. If your patient has um, a raised blood sugar, then you want to bring it down. You want to monitor the patient closely by giving intensive uh, insulin therapy. Then also fluid resuscitation to maintain systemic pressure. Because you don't want to, the patient to even go from septic shock to hypovolemic uh, shock. Patients can have all this combined. So because of that, you want to maintain uh, fluid of the patient. Then physiological dose of corticosteroid to correct renal adrenal insufficiency. This uh, corticosteroid, you only give this corticosteroid if you don't have vasopressin. You give the corticosteroid if there is no vasopressin. If you don't have it on that, then you give uh, the initial dose and the maintainer's um, dose of it. So thanks for listening. Uh, welcome, contribution, and question. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, uh, the facilitator. So, so it's now for a uh, question and answer. Please, if you have any question, kindly raise up your hand so that, but I can see that so many people raise their hands. I will put your hands down. Then if you have questions, you can put your hands up back so that, because I discovered that so many people don't know how to even use Zoom, so they just raise their hand. So and we can't take 
we not take more than five questions. If you have further uh, any question apart from the five, if your question have not been answered, you can contact the e tutor through the uh, either SMS or WhatsApp or the uh, what they call it through the call. So we have two facilitator here, so and they are ready to answer your question. So I will be calling you one by one. Uh, Akin Yele. Akin Yele, your question. Akin Yele. Tolu lope will I be? your question. Okay, we'll see. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for the uh, for the uh, facilitation. Thank you. I appreciate you. My question is under the pathogenesis of infection. You talked about colonization under the stages of infectious disease. I want you to explain more on that colonization and the resolution. Is that all? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. <coughs> okay. Uh, Aki, yes, sir. Okay, Aki, okay, we'll see. Well, the colonization is just after yeah. initial encounter with the viral infection or bacterial infection. The microorganism will have to survive and multiply under local conditions. We talk about the temperature and the the pH and other environmental conditions so that they can reestablish themselves in their new host. So what happened this, in this phase is that uh, some species uh, will, uh, will release uh, uh, some enzymes that we call mucolytic enzymes that will allow them to penetrate the mucous layer of their host. Now, immediately the virus enters into the body. Let me take, for instance, um, the present coronavirus, maybe through inhalation, it will stay on the sur surface of the body, of the mucous uh, membrane. So the microorganism, the virus will not want to enter into the cell. So it will release um, a particular enzyme, depending on the species, species of that um, microorganism. Could some releases mucolytic, some uh, adesine, depending on their uh, species, they will release a particular enzyme that will enhance their penetration into the cell of the of the into the mucous membrane. So that because majorly they are usually attacked, in fact, they will attack the uh, the DNAs and the cell membrane of the body. So they want to enter. That's what happened during colonization because they want to make them that that particular environment theirs at that moment, so that it will give them opportunity to replicate and to multiply. Thank you. Then for resolution, after inflammation and uh, encounter and all other phases damage, and the body is able to survive, then there will be resolution of all the um, the uh, the debris. Maybe there is damage to the cell, and there is formation of debris. The process of resolution, phagocytosis takes place in the process of uh, resolution, in which it will eat up those cell debris and there will be um, a resolution so that the body can return back to normal. The cells of the body can return back to normal. Thank you. Let me see your question. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon, ma'am. Please, my question, uh, when you were explaining factors apart affecting pathogenic mechanism of virus, there was a network problem, so I couldn't get it. Before it not joined, you joined, when I network came back, I started where you, where you said about disease. So I have problem with that part. And another of my question is, huh? I'm hearing. Hello. I said the second question is a pattern of but pattern of said that please show the slide again where you said about co, um, before coagulative lymphatic granulosis and fat and fibrin notes. I want to see that again, please. Okay. Thank you. I'm done with the question. Okay, your first question you're asking about factors that affect pathogenic and accessibility of virus to T. Yes. That's the first one. Accessibility of the virus to that particular tissue. And I explained that if there is a break in continuity of tissue, or let me use the present uh, coronavirus, you touch, maybe you touch an infected um, object and you now, the individual now puts the hand in the nose or come in contact with the virus in one way or the other, then the virus will be accessible to that tissue. So without coming in contact with the virus, then the, the pathogenic mechanism or mechanism cannot take place in the first instance because the by encounter is the first thing. If you don't come in contact with the virus, definitely you can't be infected by the virus. So that's the first thing. Uh, first, uh, thing. Then cell susceptibility to that virus, to virus multiplication. It, now, I will still use coronavirus as an example. Patients with comorbid uh, diseases are more susceptible to virus infection. Patients with uh, immune deficiency are more susceptible to infection. So that's what we see in cell susceptibility to virus uh, multiplication because the virus will multiply better in their body because the immune system cannot fight it is lower already. The third one is virus, virus susceptibility to host defenses. That is virus resistance to host defenses. How well the virus can resist because immediately an antigen or a microorganism enter the body, the body also will want to fight back. So if the virus is not able, is, is able to combat and win the battle now, that's what you call virus susceptibility to host infection. Thank you. Thank you. Of Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you for the session and the lectures. Please, I want to be more clarified on the pathophysiology of um, an anaphylactic shock. Again. The More clarification on the pathophysiology anaphylactic. of anaphylactic shock. Yes. Well, we actually discuss um, pathophysiology of um, septic shock, not anaphylactic shock. But you, um, the anaphylactic shock is as a result of immune reaction, which will not trigger um, shock. And when you have, especially when you have autoimmune disease, in which the body is fighting against itself, that will result, a lot of organ will become, will be compromised. When you have um, a case of rheumatoid and arthritis that sometimes affect the heart muscles, and the heart is unable to pump blood as it should, then definitely the body, the, 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 the body will not be able to cope with the stress is encountering at that moment and can result into shock. So the major thing that causes an anaphylactic shock is immune reaction between the body and the body fighting against that, uh, um, that, that which may predispose the body to um, shock. Thank you. Now why your question? Okay, you don't have a question. Emmanuel Bale. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Good 
Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Your question. All right. The what I just want the facilitator to emphasize more is about the process of the damage. We spoke about the buck effect, toxins related and the host response to infection, and also to help us emphasize more on the chronic and uh, the chronic and the acute type of inflammation. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, thank you. We talked about I'm trying to check the slide. Okay. Uh, we talked about bulk effects. And I said in helmet effect form. That's where we have bulk uh, effects of damage. And in helmet um, infection, the worm will block um, the, the worm will block the intestinal tract tract or it, it will either block the lymphatic um, vessels. That's that's what we see in elephantiasis in filariasis. In filariasis, the worm will block the the fatty vessels, preventing proper and normal flow of the um, of the fluid, and this will lead to accumulation of the fluid in the tissue around the leg. Mostly, is usually around the leg, and that's where you see elephantiasis. The leg is big because the lymphatic um, tissue is blocked by the worm, and fluid is being lost into the extravascular uh, spaces. And the second um, thing we discuss. Is also response to the infection, how well the body is able to respond to that infection. Try to see the slide, to check through the slide, please. I'm coming. I will respond to your question. I'm trying to check the slide. Third one is toxin mediated. And I gave the example of uh, tetanus, that the toxins release is tetanus per me, and they act on the nerves. They have their target sites. Even though they will enter, enter through the skin, which is the local site, they will spread, they will release their toxin to other sites of um, infection. And that toxin will now, uh, that site of injury, and that toxin will now spread to their target site. So that's what we call toxin mediated then the bulk effect is that of ailments in which the worm will block the blood vessels or the lymphatic vessel. And the last one is host response um, to infection, the body of the host fighting the infection or losing the battle to the microorganism. Thank you. Yes, I get it. Get it. Hello. Can you please ask your question? All right. Uh, my question is, uh, we can't hear you. Okay, sir. Can you can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. All right. I wanted to ask on the nature of the exam question. Uh, precisely how the exam question. I'm sorry, it's not clear. Drama. It's not clear. Please make it clear so that you can understand what you are trying to ask. I said, um, I want to know about the nature of the exam questions. Okay, is this is the exam uh, question you are asking? Yes, yes. Just read your, what do you call it? What, do you, have, what you have been taught online in face-to-face -face, and this uh, online facilitation and this face-to-face. -face. Your question will not beyond what you have been taught. Thank you. Please read in between the lines because you have um, fill in the gap. 
fill in the gap, you also have MCQs. Then you may have uh, some list, um, list uh, questions that you'll be asked to list or highlight. So those are the things you may find in your exam. But it won't go beyond what you were taught, either through the LMS or the one we are having presently. Anything, your question. Okay. Lastly, just pick anyone now, then you can contact the project uh, later. So, Ali, you, your question. Hello, sir. Hello. Yeah, actually, the question has been answered already. Okay, thank you. So, we'll call it a day. So if you have any other question, you can reach your uh, facilitator. Two of them are here. They will call their phone number for you. You can chat with them or drop the SMS for them. Okay, I have my colleague here, um, Tito Abayomi. I, I his phone number. My own phone number is 08111. Zero five one eight six two. Hi everyone. My name is Mr. Jola. You can contact me on zero zero six seven nine zero three eight three seven. Can I take that again? Zero 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 six seven nine zero. Three eight, three seven. Thank you. So thank you. We have come to the end of today's face-to-face uh, -face presentation. We meet tomorrow. God bless you, and stay safe. Thank you.